Hello, everybody, and welcome to Perspectives, still the home edition. Good to have you with us today. We're going to do something a little different, something I've wanted to do for a long time. We're going to dissect a mind. Yes, we are. And the mind belongs to a friend of mine, John Woolley. John, are you there? I am, but I didn't know dissection was going to be involved, Sam. <laughs> Painless. <laughs> First of all, thank you, my friend, for taking time to come in. Oh, thank you for asking me. This is great. You're there on the campus at Rogers State. Right. And I'm shooting this from my home. Uh, so things are still kind of anagogal, if you will. John, in all fairness, you are labeled in my mind as a professional writer slash friend. I got to know you as a writer many years ago. I'd be curious to know, and I think the folks would too, when did writing, when did the writing bug bite for the first time? Well, my grandmother was a writer, Sam, and she was a poet, uh, but she also, her little secret was that she made her living writing for confession magazines. Now, there are not so many confession magazines around now like there used to be, but the confession magazines like True Story or True Confessions, all of that. And I got to know that when, uh, this is my, my grandmother on my father's side. My father died when I was very young, and my grandmother lived in St. Paul, Minnesota. And we go up and see her every summer, my brother and I, my mother, and there would be these stacks of sort of lurid magazines that we would discover underneath chair cushions and things. And it turned out that she had written these. Now, confession magazines were, were allegedly written by these young women who'd gotten into different sorts of trouble and then gotten out of it. My grandmother was a rock-ribbed Presbyterian, and she sort of defended or uh, acknowledged what she did with these stories as... Um, the, all of them having a good moral. So uh, I would talk to her about writing, and uh, she was really the one who encouraged me to write. I, I think I got my first rejection slip when I was 14 years old, and uh, <laughs> it was from Fantasy and Science Fiction, a magazine, magazine of fantasy and science fiction. Sold my first story when I was 19. If I can tell you a little bit of story about my grandmother, who I called Dammy, uh, when I was, when she was in her 90s, I think she was 94, uh, was, I visited her in, in St. Paul. I was in college at the time, and we're sitting out talking about writing as we did. She had an old two-story house, looked down on St. Paul, Minnesota. And I said, well, Dammy, have you, have you got any new writing projects coming up? She said, well, she said, yeah, by this time, she, you know, she was very forthcoming about her confession magazine stories. She said, yeah, she says, I've, I've got a little confession story that I've done, and, and I'm really trying to write younger. Well, she was 94, but so I'm really trying to write younger, trying to write more from your age. So this is about a girl about your age who makes some bad choices, and, and, but it ends up, it's got a great moral, and everything ends up all right. And I said, well, great. I said, do you have a title for it? She says, yes, I just call it, I don't know which hippie is the father of my child. And that was, uh, that was the last <laughs> story I think my grandmother wrote at the age of 94. <laughs> yeah. What a great story, She was John. a dandy. Oh, she was a great one. She is, she's my inspiration for, for becoming a writer. Somebody once said uh, that they, they are asked, how do you do this? How do you make it happen? And they say, well, or supposedly said, I, all I do is sit down and open a vein. Yep, that's what I believe. That's been attributed to a lot of people, Sam. I think it's the, the great sports writer, Red Smith, who is the one I've heard it attributed to. But that's right. Writing's, this is not, writing's not hard. You just sit down and open up a vein. And that's, that says a lot in <laughs> itself. It does. John, do you work... Uh, do you work 24-7? I mean, it would seem to me even when you're not writing, you're thinking about what you are involved with or exploring the concept, a new concept that you want to write. Which, which comes first for you? You know, Sam, it's kind of like what you do with certain professions. It's hard to see where the person stops and the profession starts. Mm -hmm. Because I know you're always looking for things to, to talk about. You're always looking for things for the program. I know, of course, we met each other 
uh, when I covered you and covered that, we were talking before we went on the air about that wonderful uh, supernatural documentary you did back, I guess, in the 90s. And A long uh, time back. We're always thinking uh, about about what we can do. So, you know, there's a uh, there's a, a quote from I believe it's Henry James said, "Be a person on whom nothing is wasted." And I really like that little aphorism. And so, you know, for for if you're lucky enough to be able to write or 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 broadcast or or whatever do that kind of thing for a living then I think yeah you're always you're really always working you know broadcasting um, technically has made so many advancements and I am just so proud that I've been around to see so many of the technical changes that have come about I remember Edward R Murrow once said uh, if we don't handle this correctly television is going to be just a box with wires. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that in some cases it could be classified as that today. On the other side of the coin, we have operations like 60 Minutes mm -hmm. who, you know, who give us, all of the folks involved with 60 Minutes, give us such great work, such great information that we need to know about. And we need more of that sort of thing. Uh, and I can't help it. I I remember Walter Cronkite said once after he retired that I still, if I hear a siren, will go out the front door to the, to the street and look in both directions. He said, it's a matter of curiosity. Does the curiosity bug bite you a lot? Always. You have to be interested in a lot of things you, in order to, I think, do what, what we do. And, you know, Walter Cronkite, uh, after as you were you were talking about after he had his broadcast career, somebody asked him, he said, now that you're through with broadcasting, is there anything about what's going on now that really bothers you? And Walter Cronkite said, and I've, I've thought about this a lot, he said, yes, he says, I'm afraid we're getting a lot of facts, but we're not getting to the truth of anything. Yeah. Yeah. And if that's that's become even, I think, more profound in the subsequent years. He also said, uh, and it's not a direct quote, so I'll paraphrase, he cautioned against those of us on the inside of the industry from becoming too enamored with all the, the, the toys, the technical developments. And he said, sometimes you sacrifice the truth for the toys. Mm -hmm. That's a good, very good point. And you know, you're talking about things like 60 Minutes. I would add uh, certainly public television and, and public radio to that. Uh, I think that that's one of the greatest things that's really come along. You know, when I was a kid, and of course I'm dating myself, but when I was a kid, I remember when the first educational channel came on in Tulsa, and all they did was show like Encyclopedia Britannica 16 millimeter shorts, right? Uh, yeah. we, had, we had two, six, and eight, and that was it. And then 11 came along. And now look at how far that's come, how far a public uh, television has come. You have your program here at, here, here at RSU TV. I have mine. I have Film Noir Theater with Anna Berry. And, uh, you know, where else, could, where else could we do these programs? And uh, they both have followings. And I just think that, that the idea when you take the profit motive out of something, I think, that really augurs well toward getting to maybe more truth or more things, more interesting concepts uh, that you can try. I'm, I'm not going to hit you with a silly question like, where do all these ideas come from? Right. But I'm going to hit you with this question of where do all those ideas come <laughs> from? And, and let me tell you how I want to frame it. Uh, Tulsa is a unique town. It is. Uh, in so many ways. We are at the crossroads of one of the largest Indian populations in the world. Yes. Uh, we, have, we have movers and shakers within the tribes. We have folk who have come here who have taken advantage, and justifiably so, of, of well, with the exception of what they did to the Osage, uh, of, of the rich uh, oil deposits. And we've seen... Uh, a country depend on that oil 
through two world wars. And I, it's just astounding the developments that have come out of this region. And what I've discovered about myself, and only in the last few years, it happens especially after sundown. If I'm driving around in the downtown area, which I'm prone to do frequently when there's very little traffic, you can't drive by an intersection. You can't drive by many buildings where there isn't some sort of rich lore just hovering. And if you know a little bit about this town, I hand to God, you can see it. You can smell it. It's, it, it just it becomes all-encompassing. Sometimes I'll get out with a, with a single lens reflex camera, take a few pictures. And I'm just mesmerized. Does that happen to you, John? Yes, and it happened because I've written about entertainment so much. It's especially happened when you think about uh, when you think about the entertainment history legacy yeah. of Tulsa. And you know, uh, people often one of the things I've written an awful lot about Tulsa movies and Tulsa music and all the stuff, uh, all the stuff around this area, all the entertainment things around this area, entertainment styles and and all of the things that we've done. And of course, if you do that, I'm sure, again, just like you in your career, at some point you start thinking, well, are we really unique? Or would somebody from, you know, uh, a town in Rhode Island or, uh, or you know, Lincoln, Nebraska, would they, would they say the same thing? And I really have to say, Sam, that no, that we are. We are unique or we are at least unusual in the richness of our popular culture. John, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, I want to talk with you about the actual physical business of writing. And uh, I also want to talk a little bit about your television venture. Okay. If that's all right. Sure, we'll take great. a short break, folks. We'll be back with more from John Woolley right after this. <laughs> 